you have your Bibles, open them to Luke chapter 23. Then you can stick your finger there and look over to Mark chapter 10. We'll be looking at two different passages. Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Amen. It makes all the difference in the world. Some people call it Easter. That's what the world calls it. I've, um, I, I like to just recognize that that's what the Lord did. It is a day that we celebrate that our Lord was resurrected. It changed everything, everything whatsoever, everything totally, completely, and I am so very, very grateful. I've been in a series called The Gospel is Good News. Today I'm going to kind of go in a little bit of a different uh, line, but uh, the gospel is, that's exactly what it means, is good news. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. If we didn't have Jesus, we would have no hope. We would have nothing that is good whatsoever. We would have no, we would really not know what love is all about. So today I want to talk about four men, two of them that had known Jesus for quite some time, and two that had uh, never even met Jesus before that day that was such an uh, unbelievable day, and that was the first day they had an ca- uh, encounter with Lord. There's a, a lot that can be said about our story, that can be said about what we go through. There's a lot of circumstances that make up our lives. Um, our family, <clears throat> by the way, it's nice to see so much of our family with us today, and I appreciate you coming and being with us today. If you're our guest, you are loved, you are prayed for, and uh, New Holland stands for you. They love you very much. Uh, Our family makes so very much of us. Our homes, our upbringing, uh, all the influences, friends that come into our life, those things are very important to us. But some of us, some of us are born into privilege, some of us not so much. Some of us uh, have very stable, healthy environments. Some grow up in places where they never feel love. They don't really know what it means to be nurtured and cared for. All of us have different circumstances. Some are just a little harder to overcome than others. But hear me and hear me well. All of us have a soul, and every one of us matter to God. To God, there are no throwaways. Every life matters completely and totally we have a conscience we were born to have a conscience that would lead us and guide us to hear the whisper that comes from god some just follow the shouts in their own hearts that may be a little different from what god wants them to hear they may shout a little longer i really want to talk about two of these men that i think uh, two of these four men that found themselves at a place that they were not looking for themselves to be, but they found themselves right there at a front row seat at the most pivotal place in all of history. We know them simply as criminals. They were called, and the King James called them malefactors. The word means evildoers or wrongdoers, but listen to this, also means a robber. That's how we know them as the thieves that were crucified, one on the right hand and one on the left of our Lord. When we think about them, they just lived a life of doing what they wanted to do, taking a shortcut, stealing from someone else, most likely by harm or the threat of harm, and they just took it and lived the life that they wanted to live. But it was a life that was an empty life. So many people live empty lives. But they were caught. They were arrested. They were tried. They were sentenced. Condemned to death. And on this very important day, they were executed on a very public road outside of Jerusalem. It was that way on purpose Rome wanted everyone to see that if you committed such a crime, you would be caught, and this would be the penalty. It was to keep others from doing likewise. And yet, the one 
between those two criminals had committed no crime. He had been convicted of nothing. As a matter of fact, Pilate says, I find no fault in him. But simply the the public outcry said that he had no value. He was a throwaway. But I just want you to know, every soul has value to God. To our Lord and to our Savior Jesus Christ, to our Father in heaven, there are no throwaways. God is always looking for a wayward child to come home. And God in his sovereign will and power allowed these two people called malefactors, criminals, wrongdoers, he allowed them to find themselves at the most pivotal place, at the most pivotal time, a place that we would know as Calvary, watching as Christ would be crucified. And yet, I want us to talk about two others first. Before we get to the criminals, I want us to talk about two people, called one called James, one called John. They were fishermen by trade. They uh, lived a hard life as well. They provided with their family, uh, fighting the hard elements of life. They were fishermen. Not always easy. Not always a, a very thankful job. They were probably overlooked as well. But Jesus saw something in them, and they saw something in Jesus. And Jesus liked to give nicknames. He gave Simon the nickname Peter, Rock, Stone. But to these two, who would be part of his inner circle, the inner three of the 12 disciples, he called them the sons of thunder. They were probably very loud, probably harsh, and sometimes scary. But into their life, he invited them in because no matter what the world saw, he saw value and he cherished it. If you look in your Bible today in Mark chapter 10, I want to talk about a unique time in their life. It says, now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. So he was walking ahead of them. And all those that were following behind, look what it says in verse 32, they were amazed. Amazed. Just to be in the presence of God was amazing. His spirit, his anointing, the power, that, the, the, just the, the presence of him. They were just awestruck by it. The word literally means they were astonished. But it also says there, It says not only they were amazed, but it says, and as they followed, they were afraid. To be in the presence of greatness, the power. They had seen him give sight to the blind. They had seen him speak to disease to leave. To give one who had no power to walk, the ability to stand up and walk and to leave. There was something unique about this man. They were amazed and astonished by him. But hear me now. They also knew their own life. They knew their own sins. They knew their own shortcomings. And they were uh, greatly afraid to even be in his presence, though they had been there for three and a half years. But look what it says. And as they followed, they were afraid, and he took the twelve aside, Jesus knowing their thoughts, and he began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Look what it says in verse number 33. Behold, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be, here's the word, betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes. They will condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles, They will mock him, scourge him, spit on him, and kill him as he tells his disciples about himself. But then he says, and the third day he will rise again. That is the gospel. 
That is the good news. That Jesus loved us and was willing to go to the cross of Calvary and pay the penalty of our sins, willing to die. To go through all of those things. He knew it ahead of time. He said it plainly. They will mock him, scourge him, whip him with the cat of nine tails, spit on him, and kill him. But don't worry. He'll rise the third day. Now listen to James and John in verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, when everybody asks a question like that, you know something's up, right? They probably uh, separated themselves from the 12, got up to where Jesus was, and it's just the three of them there, and, and, and they, they, they ask this question, Lord, would you do for us whatever we want you to do? Jesus said to them, verse 36, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant us that we may sit on your right hand and on your left, come on now, in your glory. We want to be there with you. We know who you are, the Son of God. We know the Bible talks about the kingdom of God and the power of God, and, and, and Jesus just know that We'll be there for you. James and John, we'll, we'll let one of us be on the right hand. We'll, one of us be on the left. We'll be there for you to stand with you and protect you and help you in every way. Listen to Jesus' reply, verse 38. You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Oh, so Proudly and so boldly. I mean, a mouth will say anything, right? They had a high view of themselves. And they said, oh, of course, we are able. We'd be more than willing to do this. Just ignoring what he just told them. He told them the truth. He told them what was going to happen. But all they could see was the glory. And maybe wanted a little slice of that glory for themselves. Can you do this? Are you willing to drink the cup that I drink? Are you willing to go through the baptism showing the, the death, the burial, and then the resurrection? Are you willing to go through that? We're able. Verse 39, so Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it is for those to whom it is prepared. Now, hold on. Two of the disciples are asking this request. Ten of them heard behind them. When the ten heard it, it says in verse 41, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Hey, what are you doing? You're just wanting to push yourself to the front. What about the rest of us? But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, he's going to give them a little truth. Maybe we can hear a little bit of that truth here today. You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them? And their great ones exercise authority over them? Maybe that's what they wanted. Yeah. But he says, let it, he said, um, yet it shall not be so among you. And whoever desires to become great among you shall be the servant. Whoever, whichever, whomever of you desires to be first shall be the slave of all. And even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and then he goes beyond, and to give his life a ransom for many. Don't you understand? The Gentiles want people to serve them. But if you want to be great, it's not about you. It's about the cause in which you're called to. It's about God and letting your life bring him glory. Let him put in a smile on God's face by, by lowering yourself and serving others, serving the ones that he loves, giving yourself. He gives the great example. He just said what he was going to do for them. And he says, I didn't come to be served, 
but I came to serve. Take your Bible and look over into Luke 23. I want us to talk about the other two. I want you to see what was going on in their life on this very fateful day. As they took the cross and laid it on the ground with all of heaven watching and they laid them on the cross and then a soldier would take a nail and a hammer and nail their hands to the cross and their feet to the cross and they would be raised naked and the cross would fall down into a hole that had been set for them, hung between heaven and earth. For all to see and gaze, for all to look upon, the King of Lords laid there humbly or stood there humbly before them, nailed to the cross, having done nothing wrong. Mark or excuse me, Luke 23, verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led away with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, a place that we sing about with joy, the place of the skull, the place of execution and death, there they were crucified, and the criminals, listen now, one on the right hand and one on the left. I wonder the screams of those men when they drove the nails into his hands and his feet. When you squeeze something, what's on the inside comes out. And these two that had lived a life of sin and hatred and without care, who had been caught and tried, and now they're being executed. You know they screamed in pain, and you know all kinds of evil must have flown from their mouth. But Jesus never said a word. Never right recognized the pain. He took it and he bore it because it... Though he bore it, it was my pain that I deserved. My ridicule. Now hear his words. He's not mocking and cursing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Interceding on the behalf of those who were mocking him and spitting upon him. Pulling out his beard. The last part of verse 34, it says, and they divided his garments and cast lots. They saw no value in Jesus. They saw more value in his clothes than they did in the human. The Savior of the world who was there dying for them. Verse 35, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers, the leaders of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin were there looking on. And it says, they sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Let him save himself. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, say yourself. Because you see, there was a, something that Pilate wanted written above them. It says, an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew so that anyone could read, this is the king of the Jews. They saw that and they said, oh, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And even one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him. 
It doesn't need to go into any more detail than that, but you can, you can just imagine the tenor of his words. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. The Jewish leaders, they mocked him. He saved others. Let him save himself. The soldiers, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. This criminal by his side, if you are the Christ, the anointed one, save yourself and us. Church, listen to me. He didn't come to save himself. He came to save me and you. The power was not in coming down from the cross. The power was staying on the cross. The power was enduring the mocking and the pain and the shame, the humiliation. To go through all of those things that he went through. And yet, from his own lips was love. Pure, unadulterated love. But one saw the truth. (laughs) Praise God, we can talk about him today. One saw the truth. Look in verse number 40. But the other, the other criminal answered, he answered the the other criminal, his partner in crime. And he rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God? Seeing you're under the same condemnation, We indeed justly, he knew that he had sinned. He was caught. He knew that he was paying the penalty for his own crimes. For we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He didn't know Jesus. He was not our follower of Christ. But to be in the presence of the glory of God, to feel the love, to feel the touch, in his spirit, to face eternity as we all do. And to know that we have sinned and deserve punishment. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. He knew he had done wrong. And he rebukes and says, why are you condemning this man? This man has done nothing wrong. Then he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, Master, you see him placing himself other. He's not demanding, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. Jesus took a little pause there on the cross and looked over at his new friend and said, Assuredly, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me, say it with me, in paradise. We've dreamed of it. We've thought of it. We've read of it. We've longed for it. A place where we could put the the trappings of this world behind us, the hurts and the pains and the condemnation that we've all felt and all the sins that we deserve the penalty of. We know that there's a holy God who created us and loves. What are we going to do? We're going to listen to the sounds of the world? We're going to hear... Their wisdom, or are we going to listen to the voice that whispers in our heart where God calls us to himself, waiting for another child to turn and come home? He knew his sin. He sought grace. And he found it from his new Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What happens next is very important. Listen to me. Look what it says in verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Heaven could not even look at this. By the way, 
for all the doubters in the world. Resurrection Sunday, Passover as they looked at it, is the first Sabbath after the full moon, after the spring equinox. That's how we find it every year. It would be impossible for from noon to three o'clock An eclipse could not happen. It could not occur for the sun to be darkened and not to shine. It wasn't that the sun was hid except by the hand of God. Verse 45, Then the sun was darkened, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. They could not take his life, but he could give it freely. Because it was Passover, they wanted to do this quickly. They wanted to have these criminals they called down from the cross and in the tomb before the sun went down. So the order was sent for the soldiers to take clubs and break the legs of those on the cross. Literally, as you hung on the cross, your weight would pull down, the stress on your diaphragm, where you could not breathe, you would have to push up to get a breath. Then exhaustion, you would file down again. So they would come by to break the legs so that you could not push up and literally you would suffocate without ever being able to get a breath. When they came to Jesus, they found that he had already died to make sure they took the spear and thrust it in his side. And sure enough, Jesus was dead. But they went to the soldiers, broke their legs, and in moments... Minutes, seconds that we take for granted in our everyday life. They bowed their head to this world and opened their eyes into another. One opened their eye, his eyes, having lived a, a life of criminal crime and thinking of himself and probably like all of us, wanting the best in life, but always coming short. Without Jesus as his Savior and Lord, he opened his eyes, separated from God forever. That's the scariest words I know in my vocabulary. Separated from the love of God forever. No hope. It's done. You do your choosing while you're living. But after your life, there's no holding station. There's no wait station. There's no enough prayers that somebody else can pray for you. You've got to pray for yourself. You have to make your decision for yourself. None of us can imagine the despair that he was under even in that moment. Oh, but the other. As he drew his last breath, absent from the Bible, the Bible says, excuse me, absent from Life, opening your eyes to see the very presence of God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. He probably lived his life with a hope. Maybe. Hope so. I'm a good person, judging himself by himself. But because he cried out to Jesus and Jesus saved him, he opened his eyes to feel love like he had never felt before. Peace. What a wonderful word. Peace. No anxiety. <laughs> Just love and the goodness of God. And to feel for the very first time he was home. Home. Forever home. 
the best of God given to us. Not because of anything we've done, but by what Christ did. This week, one day this week, Wednesday night, Wednesday early morning, I woke up about 3 o'clock with this verse on my mind. And I just repeated that verse in my mind over and over and over as the hours went by until day finally broke. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And he that is God made him who knew no sin to become sin that we might have the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He made Jesus who had never sinned. He made him take my sin so that his righteousness could become my righteousness. And I stand in the righteousness of God. I stand in him. That is the gospel. That is the good news. He was the very first convert of the New Testament church. A freshly convicted and condemned robber now is called child of God to live in the presence of God to never leave his grace or his glory ever again oh what a savior hallelujah he gave his life's blood for even me you know the thing that makes resurrection Sunday so powerful he gave his life. They buried him and they put him in the tomb. But he didn't stay there on resurrection Sunday morning. He was raised to walk in newness of life. Living resurrection. Forty days later, he raised his hand and ascended back to glory. And is sitting down at the right hand of the Father right now. Listening to us, we have his undivided attention. He knows every thought in your heart. He speaks a whisper to you personally. He loves you with an everlasting love. He gave his all for you. But you must receive it from him. He doesn't come to condemn your sin condemns you. He comes to forgive, and he's the only one who can. You see, we live in the balance of eternity, living through time, but ready to step into the land without time. Living in this world where, I'm sorry, but things just aren't fair but to step into the purity of the righteousness and the justice and the love of God. Or, if you so choose, because he loves you enough to let you choose for yourself, you can spend your eternity separated from him without hope, with no more chances. It's a weighty thing to have a choice. One criminal, all he could do was scream and condemn. But one, through Jesus, found his way home. I don't know how you began your life. I don't know all the things that you've gone through. But I promise you this, God wants to be the end of your story. It doesn't matter how you began your life, what matters is how you finish it. 